Yeah, look at that. Oh, that's scary. The worry I've got is that it looks like his body is now experiencing quite a significant reaction. If this continues at this rate, it could be very dangerous. There's a person outside and it looks like there's something wrong with it. Okay, well let's go and catch it, shall we? The rain is absolutely torrential. Oh, there he is, I found him. And out of nowhere, I see this little tiny thing on the ground. Oh, oh sweetheart. So he's just a little baby. I don't know that he's going to survive. That's actually his backbone there. It's his spine. Yeah. So we're really at risk of losing that tail. But as Chris begins treatment, Hank is not impressed. Is that right. him twitching? You right? Well, Chris, just watch You're out right. there. We might have to let go. You good, Bill? Yeah. Tim from the Australian Reptile Park has given me a call because he's concerned about a baby wombat called Kenny. Now, all he's saying is that Kenny has a mysterious problem. So I'm on my way there now. Let's see if I can help out. Kenny was found on the side of the road after his mum was killed by a car. Over the past month, Tim has been his foster dad hand rearing him. He's recovered really well from his original problems and he's been feeding well, he's hydrated and everything's been great. But something happened yesterday that really scared me, and that's why I've called it Ben. G'day, mate. How are you, mate? Good, how are you? There's that little mate. That's quite incredible. Look at you. He really scared me yesterday. Takes a bit to scare you. What did he do? Well, the day started out normal. So we got up, had a bottle, bit of a cuddle like this. He slept for a few hours, so I got him back up. I took him for a walk, his first walk, because until now he's been settling and in an artificial environment. Went for a walk, brought him back, and he just blew up. His eyes swelled up, his hands swelled up, around his neck went all red. I really have no idea what it could be. I don't know whether he's been bitten by an insect or um, it would seem that something triggered it, but I've got no idea. Have you got any photos of how he looked? I've got, yep, one. Look at his eyes. Yeah, wow. And that was mirrored under his chin, on his belly, and his hands. If Kenny was a dog or a cat, you'd be thinking maybe he's been bitten by a bee or maybe he's eaten something that wasn't quite right, or he's come in contact with a chemical. I mean, he, it was his whole face and his paws and everything, and I was freaking out that he was going to stop breathing. Mm. I think, Timmy, the only thing to do... Yep. ..is to take him back to the scene of the crime. Yep. Back to where it happened. I thought you'd say that. And let's have a look at what's around there yep. and make sure there's nothing that we, we're missing. Yep. As a vet in this day and age, you can run all sorts of tests, ultrasounds, MRI, CT scans, blood tests, you name it. But this test may be the most important for Kenny. It's a walk. Come on, little man. This is the same track as yesterday. Yeah, same way. Come on, Kenny. Yep, he's hot on your heels. So the funny thing is, we haven't gone over any ants' nests. No. I haven't seen one bee. No. It's just been grass. Yep. And this is the longest bit. I brought him in here, just in the fern and grass, and he loved it. He had a good play. You can see straight away, he really enjoys this, doesn't he? But that was the extent of the walk. Mm. I'm starting to think that today we're really not going to see anything of interest. Come on, Kenny. When, all of a sudden, Kenny just doesn't seem to be keeping up like he was before. He seems a bit clumsy, and then I look at his eyes, and they're different. Yeah, look at that. Oh, that makes my eyes water. He's hot all over, his ears are puffy. His eyes are really small. Eyes. What are you, man? His feet are getting really puffy too. I mean, look at those. What's really concerning me is that he looks sore, irritated, and I don't know the extent of this reaction. If we can see this on the outside, what's happening on the inside? That's scary. The worry I've got is that it looks like his body is now experiencing quite a significant reaction. If this continues at this rate, it could be very dangerous. Yeah, look at that. Oh. You can feel he's quite hot. His ears are really thick now. His eyes are swollen. Yeah. His feet are, are very puffy. So his reaction is actually happening right now. OK. You just hold on to him there. Allergic reactions become life-threatening when it starts to affect your airways. So the important thing right now is to put the stethoscope on and listen to Kenny's lungs. His heart rate and also his, his respiratory rate are actually quite high. That's from chasing after us on the walk, but yeah. also his whole body the mum is going through a, a big reaction. Yeah, he's, I can feel he's hot. Mm. 
So we need to work out exactly what he's allergic to yeah. that's causing that. But in the meantime, let's actually give him an injection straight okay. away because I just don't want this to get worse. The reaction's happening, but different to yesterday, Chris is here and he's got an injection, it's an antihistamine, and that'll slow this thing down. So if you just, yeah, that's perfect. So we'll just go between the shoulder blades here. Yep. You know from humans and bee stings, the fact that the first one is often bad, but the ones after that can be even more severe. If Kenny is like that and these reactions are getting worse with time, we need to treat him right now, otherwise this could become fatal. Hold still, buddy. Hold still. You look at where this reaction's taken place, it's around his feet, around his face, around his ears. Yeah. You look at the way warm bats walk, obviously with their feet, and the head goes through everything first. Yes. So this is a contact allergy. It's not something he's breathing in, like someone that experiences hay fever or asthma. Yes. It's something he's actually coming into contact with, because this is what hits things yeah. first. Yep, makes sense. OK, so let's... That's scary. He's going to wash it off him. Yeah. Jeez, uh, his eyes are closed yeah. now. The antihistamine injection and the wipe down have certainly bought Kenny some time, but they've also bought me some time. They've given me a chance to go back through that walk step by step to work out exactly what Kenny came into contact with. And there's really only one thing. What are you, man? Over the years, I've had to unleash a fair few surprises on Tim, but this one today might be the biggest one yet. You can see that everywhere right now, he's really irritated yeah. and you've got to feel for him. That must be an incredibly uncomfortable thing yeah. to go through. What if Kenny was a wombat that was allergic to grass? How can a wombat be allergic to grass? Exactly. It's like a dolphin that's allergic to water. Exactly. Does it really exist? Yeah. Ironically, the one thing that Kenny can't live without is the one thing right now he needs to live without. When his mum was hit by a car, all of a sudden his life changed. Yes. And he was no longer in the pouch. He's yeah. had to be hand raised. Yes. So he's never really been around grass. Yep except for the yep. walk yesterday yep. and the walk today. I've reared a number of wombats and some of them from sizes much smaller than Kenny. And each time that I've introduced them to grass, they've been fine. I'm left speechless with Kenny. How can he be allergic to grass? Kenny has lived that clean life. Because Sorry, mate. he's had to be hand raised by you. You've yep. done everything right. Yep. But in the process, he just hasn't come into contact with Yep this stuff. Does that mean he has to get used to it and he'll get better or is this going to get worse? There's no way Kenny can live his life without grass so he needs to find a way to live with it and that's where my plan comes in. There's a way we can do it but I reckon the most important thing right now let's get him off the grass. Yeah. Back to somewhere nice and cool. Okay. And recover. Yep. So away from the grass and with that injection I reckon he's going to be looking a lot better. Yeah. Oh, he looks See? much better. Straight away, he's settled down. As far as I know, Kenny is the first wombat that's ever had an allergy to grass. So we're kind of breaking new ground when it comes to his solution. What we're gonna do is take a preemptive strike yep. on his allergy. Yep. Allergies essentially work the same way whether you're a wombat, a dog, a cat, or a human. So the solution centers around that theory. And rather than him having less walks, yeah. we want him to have more walks. Righto but the walks are gonna be shorter. Yep. And he's only gonna go out to the grass for a few minutes at a time. Okay. And what you're gonna do before that is give him a quarter of one of these tablets. Yep. Brush that up into a powder. The way we're gonna deal with it is with the antihistamine tablets. It stops his body from overreacting and producing all those histamines which cause that reaction. And put that into his milk. Just like you're that. You're about to lose it, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I took a hay fever tablet this morning. <laughs> I'm not allergic to grass, but yeah, I did. So, if you guys have the same ritual, yeah. then it's perfect. So we go to sleep together, we wake up together, we medicate together. Well, it's the proper family unit, isn't it? Kenny and Tim will both have their next lot of antihistamines tomorrow. Right now, it's Chris's turn to play mum. Would you like to do the honours? Love to. Kenny's a pretty simple little character. He loves his bottle and he loves his walks. And now, hopefully, with his tablet, he might even learn to love grass as well. You think he's going to take the medicine all right? <laughs> what do you reckon? Yeah, I didn't think there'd be any problems. I like what you suggested. I think we've got a plan now that means he can still be around grass, yep. but can hopefully overcome the allergy as well. Yep. 
Ready? Into the bottle. Next morning at the Australian Reptile Park, Kenny is about to get his first dose of medication. All right, mate. There's yours. Here's mine. Time for some milk and antihistamine. Oh. Chris's instruction was Kenny needs to have his antihistamine in the morning with his bottle and then wait an hour and we can go for a walk. An hour later, it's time for the big test. Tim is anxious to see if Chris's prescribed antihistamine treatment will prevent Kenny's allergic reaction to grass. Come on, buddy, let's go for a walk. Come on. The path we're taking today is identical to the path I took yesterday when Kenny had the reaction. Come on, Kenny. Kenny's just been for a five minute walk on the grass and we've got a tiny reaction in the corner of the eye, but nothing compared to when Chris is here. I'd have to say the antihistamines are working. A delighted Tim is now heading home to share the good news with a couple of Kenny's little buddies. I think he missed you. Wombats, it's got to be my favourite because they're real individuals, real personality and character and even though I love lots of other marsupials, some of them just lack that and I don't know what it is about them, but they're really rewarding to care for. Take him for a run around the kitchen, please. He can just play with the boys. They love him, they exercise him, they keep him active, they give him his bottles. It's good for him, and it's good for them. Kenny will stay with Tim's family until he's weaned. Then his permanent home will be with the other wombats at the reptile park. Can he go on grass? He can go on grass. On an extremely wet day in Bondi, Kate suddenly gets an urgent call for help. Hello. Okay, well let's go and catch it, shall we? Is it nearby? Uh, yeah. Okay, let me go and get the towel. Okay. This little kid runs in from nowhere and he's like, possum, the possum needs help. And I have no idea what he's talking about, but my first instinct is I'll just follow him. It's gonna ruin my hair. And I'm taking Izzy. Okay, let's do it. Great, it's like cyclone weather. If the possum is sick or injured, it will stand little chance in the heavy rain. My goodness, it's like a river. The weather today can only be described as cyclonic, like next level raining. Oh no, there's a possum. He's been running from here. He's underneath the car, he's just sitting in the street. I don't know what's wrong with him. Okay. The likelihood of us finding a possum in the middle of the street in the middle of the day is near impossible. God. These guys are nocturnal. They don't come out in the day. It looks like he went in there. He, he went in was there. in there and he was hiding behind the rubbish bin. And, and then he, he, and went, then he came jumped out and then in the tree. Okay. He's been here all day. Okay. Let's wait till he moves. Not see any movement. The rain is absolutely torrential. The light is becoming super dim. I'm so conscious of the fact that we're losing light. Let me go stuff around here. And I'm thinking, we're never gonna find this. Oh, there he is, I found him. And out of nowhere, I see this little tiny thing on the ground. Hey buddy, oh, he's a little ringtail possum. Hey sweetheart, he's just a baby. This is here, this is a little baby. Oh, sweetheart. Okay, we've got one, but there's others. There's a big one. Oh, sweetheart. So he's just a little baby. I don't know that he's gonna survive, guys. He's looking like he's really cold and he's really wet. It's too late. This is too late for him. I'm not gonna be able to save him. He's just cold and he's shivering and he's shaking. He looks like he's probably got hypothermia. I don't know if he's gonna make it, honestly. He looks like he's trying to, trying to not live. Come on, let's get him back to the clinic. That's the first thing. Get him really warm and then get him some fluids. Yep. The baby possum is hypothermic and that means that his body temperature is too low to sustain life. Okay, bye. 
it is really important that we get him warm and we get him warm really quickly. While Kate's team start to take care of the baby, Kate now urgently needs to locate its mother. I have no idea where she is. Could she be anywhere? She's going to be really distressed. She's not going to have a baby. So where is she going to hide and where is she going to go? So we've got to look, I've got to look for some movement. It's the only way to find these guys. I am so determined to find this mum. Where are you, mum? I mean, I just feel for her because I think she's been running around like a crazy possum looking for her baby. OK, OK. Is that mum up there, do you think? As I'm hunting and I'm searching, I'm searching every tree, I spot this little possum box. I just know, I have this feeling that she's in there. <sighs> We've got to focus on now trying to save this baby, right? So at least if we can do one thing good, it will be to save the baby. Hey, don't get hit by a car, Izzy. I'm so cold and I'm so wet. I'm so happy to get out of this rain, even just for one second. Oh, look. Oh, he's in a little sock. Is he all right? Yeah, he's just cold, but he's been hair dried and he's just getting warm. Oh, this is nice and warm. All of my girls have put in such a mammoth effort to keep this little baby alive. And there he is in this little sock, snug as a bug in a rug. This is our makeshift pouch called a sock. <laughs> the possum is safe and slowly getting warm but every minute is critical to see if he will survive. This is a heated blanket, so we use this for surgery, and it's called a bear hugger, and it really acts like a big bear hugging them so that they don't get cold. Well, it looks like at least he's not injured, right? So it just sounds like as though he's cold and he's wet. I thought he was dead, but it turns out right here, this has helped keep him alive, so that is good. Ideally, I could find the mum so I can put them back together, but I can't find the mum. I really want to reunite these two because for the little guy, the reality is, is that growing up without his mum, that's bad news. It may mean that he can never return to the wild because he can't fend for himself. And so if we can't find mum, it pretty much changes the course of this little guy's life. Okay, you ready? Kate is going to make another attempt to locate the baby's mum. We've got to do it before it gets dark. Once it's dark, we're, we've got no hope. Let's go. OK, guys, she's going to be somewhere. Let's think positive. Positive thoughts. Objective, finding mum. If we don't find mum, this little baby possum has less of a chance of living as an orphan than he does of having a parent. I'm just going to go check this tree. OK, she's got to be around here somewhere. OK, no ringtail possum moms. I'm really disappointed and I feel like, oh, I can't find her. I've searched everywhere. I will be so happy if I can find mum because it means that I get to reunite these two. Okay, well, there's like a box up in this tree and like it's got a hole in it and it looks like there's possibly something in there. I have no proof of this, but I am swear that she is in that possum box. And then just as we're like debating how to get her out of the box thing. Where is she? She just runs out of the box. And then all of a sudden she sees us all and then just makes a run for it. So she runs all the way up the top of this enormous gum tree that we're never ever going to get her. So now we're back to square one. I think we're in a position where we basically just now have to wait until the baby's well enough that we can put the baby back somewhere and hopefully that she finds it. Oh my God, it's so warm here. I feel like I need to be wrapped in a bear hugger. Holy moly, I thought you were dead, little guy. I thought you were a goner. And look at you. Inside, the baby possum has made a remarkable recovery. I think we should call him Peter. Peter? <laughs> Peter the possum. Honestly, he is getting better by the second. Like right in front of my eyes, I see this little possum like just come to life. You know, this baby little possum that was on the brink of death, you know, and now he's opened his eyes. So it's just magical. It's a really, really good moment. It's a good moment for everybody. He wants to live, he needs some food. After Peter is feeling better, 
It's really important now that we call wires so we can get a carer to come and collect him. These guys are absolutely amazing and I just know that they're gonna do an absolutely brilliant job in looking after Peter. Oh, hello. Oh, sweetheart, hey. And he's a good little guy. His yeah. name's Peter. <laughs> Kara Alona is delighted to meet courageous little Peter. So he's good, he's like nice and robust. Yeah, get the pouch and yeah, take okay. him home and bring him back in a few days. Yep. Reuniting with his mum. That'd be amazing. This was a perfect outcome. It would have been better if we could have caught the mum and we could have reunited them, but that was probably asking a little bit too much. We found the baby, we rescued the baby, a baby that was on the brink of death, and he has gone to a carer and he's gonna be okay. Look okay. after him, hey? Good news for Peter the Possum, who was reunited with his mother the next day. I've just received a call and I've got to take a bit of a detour. A, a massive storm blew up last night and I'm suspecting this penguin I'm going to see right now was caught right in the middle of it. Hello. Go in here and up. No worries, thank you. American visitors Dan and Ashley have found an injured penguin washed up on Bondi Beach while they were going for a late night swim. I'm just going to have a little look at him, yeah, and yeah, I just don't want to stress him out too much right now. I figured he might be in a little bit of trouble, kind of the way he was walking, the way he was using his wing and stuff, so uh, we couldn't really leave him there, so we decided we'd grab him. Is there a name for him? We've been calling him Harmon. Harmon. <laughs> so was he unable to move when you, when you saw him? No, he wasn't that able to move, he just seemed like he didn't really want to, didn't really want to move that much. He just seemed like he was kind of struggling and he did move. He's not meant to be in a bathtub, yeah. so in his mind, he's freaking yeah. out right now. Harmon must be terrified. I'm thinking the poor little guy normally lives in a penguin colony on the northern side of the harbour. And during last night's storm, he's been tossed around and blown way off course. That explains how he ended up being washed ashore at Bondi at 3am. But it doesn't explain why he's so weak and why he's left himself so open to predators. Mm -hmm. buddy. Go get better, huh? Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. There is something seriously wrong with little Harmon and there's absolutely no chance of him surviving the ocean until I figure out what it is. Back at the clinic, Chris is trying to find out why Harmon is so weak. So I'm sitting here checking his heart, which, which sounds okay. You notice his eyes are actually quite sunken, so he's certainly dehydrated. And that comes from the fact that he hasn't eaten, really, certainly today. Birds, like penguins, get their water through their fish, and if he hasn't eaten, then he hasn't drunk either. Pretty small, aren't you? I reckon you might be young. Young kid not able to handle a big surf, huh? Is that what happened? As he checks the penguin's weight, he makes an alarming discovery. Give me a second. What is that? Can't be. You see this? That's a tick. Look at it, it's been feeding off little Harmon here for at least a few days and all the while that ticks are feeding they're injecting their saliva which has a toxin which paralyzes them but it paralyzes them from the back forward why couldn't you stand up on the beach this morning why couldn't you run away paralyzed legs it's got to be careful to get all of the tick and that's it right there it's a big tick Big tick. A paralysis tick on a dog or a cat, absolutely. But on a penguin, it's gotta be some sort of first. Another one. Can you believe it? There it is, number two. Just in awe of the fact that one of these could 
be fatal for a big dog. He's got two. Chris is now considering giving Harmon a tick anti-serum normally used on cats and dogs. But it's impossible to predict what effect it will have on a penguin. I can give Harmon the tick serum and risk him suffering a fatal allergic reaction, or I can do nothing and potentially watch him die from the effects of the paralysis ticks. This is such a tough call. You stand up for us. Harmon is now feeling the full effects of the tick paralysis. The penguin can no longer stand up. Harmon is getting much worse, so that's really made the final decision for me. I'm going to move. I just don't think he's going to survive without having that anti serum. So I'm just going to have to take the risk there could be a potentially fatal allergic reaction. All right, fingers crossed. That's all you've got. Harmon will now be monitored constantly to make sure he has no adverse reaction to the serum. His heart rate's certainly stable. There's no sound of any bronchoconstriction, which is the narrowing of the airways in an allergic reaction. So he's tracking along pretty well. Harmon has made it through stage one of his recovery, but the little penguin still has a long way to go. He's still fighting the effects of the tick paralysis and we just won't know if that anti serum's gonna work for at least another 24 hours. You know where you're going though, don't you? To my house. You had no choice in the matter at all. Harmon needs peace and quiet to recover and to get his strength back. But a vet clinic full of barking dogs obviously isn't the place to do that. So I'm gonna have to take him home with me. That means I've got to tell my flatmates to keep the noise down. Hello, George. Hello. Just to inspect all visitors, George. It's been a torrid day for Harmon, and finally the exhausted penguin gets a much needed feed. Harmon, meet George. George went in the ocean. He didn't like it. You live in the ocean, you like it. He's living a pretty good life, with the occasional visitor. You ever get the feeling you're being watched, Harmon? Hmm? It's bedtime. I know it's early. Harmon will need to be checked during the night to make sure the anti-serum is winning the battle against the tick toxin. Have a good night's sleep, buddy. The next 12 hours are critical. You got food on your mind? Matt Finger, that's not a fish. That's a fish, here you go. Next morning, Harmon is desperate for more food. That's an improvement, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's coming. It's a good sign that he's winning the battle against the tick poison in his system. <laughs> this is why I'm quite keen to get him on his way soon. This is behaviour he'd normally display around his mum. He's begging for food and he's thinking, I'm actually going to regurgitate the food seemingly through my fingers. That's penguin saliva. <laughs> it's salty. He's pretty much ready to make the journey he was trying to attempt during that storm. So we're going to do it for him, but in a bit of a scenic way. How you going? I'm Chris. Very well. Nice to meet you, Chris Rick. Hey, Rick. Now, this is Harmon. I've never had a passenger like that in my taxi before, I must say. <laughs> but very excited. Any extra fare for him? Absolutely gorgeous. No, not at all. Good He's stuff. free. <laughs> Look at this. It's alright, isn't it? Look at that. What do you reckon? Oh, you want to go, don't you? As soon as we were out in the water, Harmon started to get excited. He's had such a tough battle. I just hope he can find his mates and get on with his life. But with wildlife releases, there's never any guarantees. Is this familiar, Harmon? It's all starting to make sense. Won't be too long. It's just a perfect spot. Quiet, secluded beach. We're surrounded by penguin colonies. 
you just have to jump into that water there and you'll find some friends. It's just spot on. You keep safe, champ. Okay. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go, champ. Here you go. Off you go. To navigate all those challenges, come through it all, and then have this. Great. Right. Hey Tim, how are you going? Yeah, I'm good, thanks mate. Look, I was just wondering if you'd be able to get up and check out one of our koalas and look, I'm going to have some shot at Dave, but maybe she's a bit off mate, but I think she's going to be a pain. Perfect day. Here's Meg. Got Meg? Jeez, yeah. wet little darling. <laughs> Meg is a very sick, depressed koala. Her joey died just a week ago. Meg's four years old now. Um, last year she lost a joey. And this year the same things happen. Sometime through the night it gets out of the pouch, whether she throws it out of the pouch or it's exploring or something. But for some reason by morning it's so cold that we find the joey and, and it, they're already deceased. I'm going to grab arms and hind legs. Yep. So all we need you to do is just keep her head up and Chris is going to have a dig around in the pouch there. The cause of Meg's pain is quickly discovered. There it is. Yeah. So if you can see, I've got my finger underneath the, the lump there. It's 50 cent piece sized. Yep. You're all right, mate. Meg's got a dramatically enlarged mammary gland. So one of her little teats and the gland associated with it is a huge size. It's sore, it's hot. And it's a big concern because if that gland isn't functioning, she just can't support a young. It's also the most likely reason why her last two joeys did not survive. You're right, Meg. I'd be thinking either a pressure build-up yep. or a mastitis. <laughs> Meg is in pain. You can see it right across her face. And from what women tell me, mastitis is one of those awful conditions that just feel terrible. A real throbbing, awful pain that just won't subside. So we're trying to help her through that whatever way we can. It's usually a streptococcus. Yep. Gets into the, into the jelly, causes infections in them. Yep. They don't thrive because their whole system's focused okay. on trying to get rid of the infection. Yep. And, I mean, sadly, they, in the end, they, they die. All right, mate. The treatment for this is going to revolve around some nice warm compresses. Yep. So essentially some, some swabs, warm water, and just massaging that gland. Okay. In, in behind the teeth there? Yeah, getting right in there. If we can break up that clot and just make it into liquid milk instead of the, the solid milk that it is, then we can get it flushing out and, and right out the end of the teeth. The antibiotics should kick in soon to relieve Meg's pain. Once the mastitis is cured, Chris is hoping Meg will finally become a successful mum. Where she's comfy. She likes you. I don't think it's me. I think I'm all skinny and I'm like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, got the, you got the touch. She's four. So let's hope that she's just young and she's not sure what she's doing and maybe next year with a little bit more maturity and, you know, that she can keep a hold of one and, you know, get one full term. Two months on and there's good news for Meg. After treatment, her mastitis has cleared up and she's about to add to the park's koala population. We kept up the treatment just for a short while and the lump disappeared really quickly. So after that, we've had a really good mating with Herman. Um, so we believe her to be pregnant and it's ended up all good. Hi, I'm here to see Chris. I've got a wallaby. Okay, great. You just want to take a seat in the waiting behind you. No worries. Thank you. At the Bondi Clinic, Ben has travelled from the outskirts of Sydney with a very special patient. This is Hugo. He's a, a redneck wallaby. He's about four years old. Um, and he's from a, a wildlife sanctuary that I run out in Dural. Um, and we've just noticed in the last week or so that he's developed a really large lump, uh, tumour looking growth in his ear. Um, so it's a bit concerning how big it is and how quickly it's come on. So we're keen to get it checked out by Chris and, and see what he thinks it might be. Hey, Norman. Come straight to Chris. Thanks, mate. The bag's wriggling, huh? It is moving a bit, yeah. yeah. Fluff him up here. Yeah, that'd be great. So I'm just trying to keep the stress to a minimum because I'm sure he's probably realised this is a bit out of the ordinary. Yeah, my buddy. All right, big bag and big wallaby, huh? Definitely, yep. yeah. Yeah. All right. We might just try to get him out nice and gently. Okay. 
That's Hugo, isn't it? Hugo's his name, yeah. He's a, a redneck wallaby. Okay. And about a week ago, week and a half ago, we noticed this big growth that had come up in his ears. So it seemed to have come up really quickly. Um, and it's very large, as you can see. It's big. I mean, and it's also really filling up the entirety of that, yeah. that ear canal there. And quite firm, too. The moment I look into that ear, it's very clear exactly why Ben's worried. There is a big lump in there. And it sounds like it's come up really quickly. So there are really two extremes. At either end of the scale, we have an abscess, which really isn't such a bad thing. We can treat with antibiotics and it should heal through to the other worst possible case scenario, which is a tumour. So he was bred in captivity and uh, when he reached sexual maturity, he started to get a little bit boisterous. So oh, really? I had to yeah, rehome him, so they gave me a call. Yep. So yeah, he came to us and we've had him for about eight months now. Since he's been with you, has he been quite calm? Initially it was, yeah, it was quite interesting to see how he reacted with the other roos. So he yeah. sort of came in and I think he's got a bit of small man syndrome, being the wallaby and there was a few big red kangaroos twice his size around. Yeah. Um, and he had to sort of prove himself to them, but pretty quickly they, they put him in his place. So yeah. of all the roos we've got at the sanctuary, I think, yeah, Hugo's probably one that I've got the, the closest bond with. And I think that's got a lot to do with his really outgoing personality. He's just got a lot of character and he's always sort of jumping around and causing mischief around the sanctuary. The challenge is if, if you have one lump, you just want to make sure you don't have two. Yeah. And so I'm going to great lengths to, to feel all over him there to make sure there's nothing else that mm -hmm. shouldn't be there. Okay, I'm pretty comfortable with not. What this clean bill of health for the rest of him means is that I can really now start to focus just on his ear. The logical thing is, is to try to get a needle in there and, and take a sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's at least going to start to narrow down the options in terms of what it could be. For sure. Come on, matey. Okay, so this is just to clean up the skin there. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure if it's the right jab or the left hook I need to worry about, but let's just see how we go. It's right, I've got your back. <laughs> so, we're right in the middle. If I put the needle in and draw back pus, we're looking at an abscess. If I put the needle in and draw back not much at all, apart from just a bit of tissue, then I'm concerned, because that could indicate we've got a tumour in our hands. Okay, immediately we're getting blood there, and quite a bit of it. Yeah, wow, okay, I did not expect that. Boy. All right. Well, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a surprise. After the initial shock of seeing the blood in the syringe, all of a sudden, everything begins to make sense. Hugo has blood in his ear, an oral hematoma. How do you get an oral hematoma? Well, if you're a wallaby, it's from fighting. What does Hugo have a reputation for doing? It's getting these out. It's the same way a boxer gets a blood clot like that. Yep. I'd say he's, he's copped a stray right hook. He's actually been boxing with one of those big red kangaroos and they've landed one on him. Okay. The thing is we can't just leave a big blood clot like this in Hugo's ear. What happens over time is the fibrous tissue in the clot starts to tighten down like it does in a scab. When it does that, it really shrinks down all the tissue around it and really causes what is essentially a cauliflower ear. If that happens in Hugo's ear, it'll really render that ear useless for him and ultimately he could become deaf as a result. So this little brawler has suddenly had his personality catch up with him. <laughs> hey, it puts you in your place, mate. Yeah. So really what I think we need to do is to get in there and remove that blood clot. Now, I obviously can't do that with him awake. Mm -hmm. uh, what I need to do is to give him a sedation and make a little cut on his ear and see if we can actually pluck that and clot out. Okay. How do you feel about that? Well, if it's, yeah, if it's got to be done, mm -hmm. definitely I want to yeah, make sure he's, he's happy and healthy long term. So if it's going to affect him long term and he's going to lose that hearing, then yeah, ultimately I'd rather get on top of it now before it gets any worse. So. Yeah. A little bit different. So Hugo isn't aware of his size, but Hugo likes to use his fists for bad reasons. Oh well, everyone likes a bad boy. Yeah, well he's that. 
Out in the waiting room, Hugo's keeper Ben is worried about his little mate. There's a lot of risks involved in sedating a wildlife species, so I'm a little bit concerned, but it's got to be done, so yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. So that's another nine mils I've managed to get out there, so that makes a total of 15 mils of blood that has come out of this ear of Hugo's. What we're really left with now inside his ear is essentially just blood clot. So this is the stuff that's going to cause him problems. OK, I'll get all cleaned up myself and then get started. Yep. Hopefully what this surgery achieves is to remove the blood clot that's in there and also bring those layers of skin back together and seal them against the cartilage of the ear. OK, so the challenge here is to incise into this blood clot without actually starting a whole lot of new planning. So I'm inside it now and it's very firm. I'm actually having to spin it around and really break down scar tissue. The more I can break up of this clot, the more chance we have of actually stopping this cauliflower ear from forming. We've got an area above it where there was the lump before. Now that's skin that's lifted off the cartilage. We need to really anchor that back onto the cartilage, otherwise it's a space that's just going to refill with blood. So in order to do that, I've got a little bit of a trick up my sleeve. Kind of literally up my sleeve because what's up my sleeve is what I'm going to use. The solution to this problem, it's not exactly high tech. In fact, most of us are carrying around the solution every day of our lives. The answer to all of Hugo's problems is buttons. The ironic thing is, I can't put buttons back on my shirts. Hopeless at it. But I can put buttons in animals' ears. Somehow it's different. The key to the buttons' success is the fact they really provide a flat surface that you can anchor onto the inside of that ear and attach in place. Once it's there, it makes sure the skin is firmly fixed to the cartilage. So the challenge is just getting it nice and firm, which it is. Okay, then we've got room for one more. So we'll just put that in that space there. Okay, so we've got three buttons in there. I'm pretty happy with how that's managing to really compress those layers of the ear together and, and prevent blood from filling in between there, which is ultimately what caused the whole problem to start with. The one thing I'm worried about is the fact that with those claws of his, he can actually get his foot up and push those, those buttons out. What I'm thinking is, I'm really going to have to bandage his ear just to stop that from happening. Okay, we are done. Let's wake him up. Now the procedure's all done, Hugo looks a million dollars. It's time to wake him up and get him home. What have you done? Now all the lovely lady wallabies will know who that hot piece of tail is. Liesl's decided that the feminine touch is really the key to Hugo's future. I'm not so sure. It stands for hot man with buttons, right? Yeah. I was going for Hugo, but yeah, that's the other interpretation, of course. Yep. Keeper Ben has been waiting patiently for news of Hugo. Yeah, definitely been watching the clock tick by. It's been almost an hour now and we haven't heard anything, so hopefully they'll be coming out soon with some, some good news, I hope. So... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, big boy. Here he is. How'd he go? Look, he went really well. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, he came through the operation brilliantly. OK. So he's just waking up now. I've, I guess I've... <laughs> Got him out to you a little bit earlier than we normally do. Yeah. Just so he's still a little bit sleepy when he goes home. For the trip home. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Big surprise to see his ear all wrapped up like that. I love the little touch with the H and that was very nice. And great, yeah, great relief just to hear that uh, the surgery went really well. I think we'll have to find him a girl one day. Turn this fighter into a lover. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Chris. Really Pleasure. appreciate it. No worries at all. He'll be fine. I'll let you know how he goes. It'll be great. And if we can see him in a couple of weeks for that, um, Get those buttons back. All right. right. Thank All you right. very much. Safe trip home, huh? Thank you. There's no doubt that Hugo goes home a lot more colourful than how he came in. But my hope is that he finds that special someone and his days of fighting are all over.
over the years I've seen plenty of animals that have been unlucky enough to be bitten by snakes, but I've never seen a snake bite victim that's been the snake itself. So right now I'm on my way to the Australian Reptile Park to see if I can help it. Reptile Park General Manager Tim Faulkner and his feisty patient are waiting for Chris in the Venom Room. You know this is my favourite room of all, don't you? Hello, mate. How are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you. You know Billy, don't you? Hey, Billy, how are you? Hey, how are you? Yeah. Good, mate. Now, where is this snake and what is he thinking? Well, we don't know what he was thinking at the time. What species do you think he is? He's not a King Brown, is he? You got it. The biggest of the big and the meanest of the mean. And he's bitten himself. Really? Yeah, in a food rage. Just being fed. Went to grab the rat, missed it, turned, yeah. boom, latched onto himself and chewed and chewed. Wow. Yeah, his name, Hank the Tank. Hank the Tank. The names the guys give the animals here often have a meaning behind them. And when they call this snake, Hank the Tank, you know that he's gonna be a big boy. Here he is. It's an honest three metre King Brown. I think it's important here to have a clear delineation of roles. I mean, you've called me in as the vet, not as the snake handler. Yeah. So it's time we pull back and... You're in, sir. Thanks, sir. Someone else to step <laughs> up. Working with anyone in this room, it's deadly. These are the world's most venomous snakes. One slip can be fatal. Back, nice. back, back here, back here. Right back. Kingy's notorious for just throwing sideways. Yeah. Billy. He's a big boy, isn't he? Through that door, mate. Yeah. Through that door. Hank just keeps on coming. He's a lot bigger than I thought. Oh. So he's reaching out for you, isn't he? Oh, now he is. Doesn't look happy. No, well, he's he's not. Game plan is Bill's going to pin. Yep. We'll go one, two on the body. Yep. Just don't go too close, because he'll whip around this way quick as lightning. Yep. Okay. And when he gets it, he'll call us on. Yep. Okay, on, mate, on that tail. That's it. Just wait for him. Got him? Yep. Okay, well done, mate. Well done, Billy. Holding on to the back of the head there, it's it's intense, like they're so strong, he's constantly fighting, and I, you know, I've got to try and fight resistance there and, and just keep that firm grip. Wow. Have you seen that before? No. Look at that, I mean, you see where his teeth are going in. Exactly, this will be fang one, fang two. Yeah. This is the first time I've actually seen it up close. And it's horrible. It's black and it looks like dirty, just rotten flesh. It's not nice. This is a few weeks old. Yeah. So it didn't progress until after a week and, and now we've got this. Is that as bad as it, it's going to get? Well, I'd be a bit worried that unless we can do something today, mm. that tissue death is going to continue. King Brown Venom has two main ingredients. One is a neurotoxin. The whole idea behind that is to try to really paralyse the prey and stop you from breathing. The second part is a cytotoxin. It kills cells. What we're seeing here is the second part in action. All the tissue has died off. That's actually his backbone there. That's his spine. Yeah. So we're really at risk of losing that tail. Yeah. You can see what, what's happened though. The venom's gone in and eaten away the muscle either side of the bone and that's why we're getting this really hollowing effect either side of his spine here. How's your hand, mate? My hand is cramping big time. Okay. My main worry is that Bill's fingers go to sleep, the snake jerks like he has been, and he pops out of his hand. Are you guys right if I start on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have you got on that hand? We've got as long as we need, but let's hurry. Yeah, go. But as Chris begins treatment, Hank is not impressed. Is that right. him twitching? Kingy's just give big body lunges. That's why there's three of us on him. Yeah. And again. Oh, look at that piece of meat. Yeah. That's what it's eaten away. Yeah. So it's eaten away everything apart from the bones. The whole idea of my treatment today is to prevent this from getting any worse. I'm using a swab that's soaked in an antiseptic to really rub off the dead tissue. If I can do that, then hopefully I'll expose the healthy tissue underneath. Okay, so that's... Cleaned up. Do you think he's still got enough blood flow now that the end of that tail might be all right? I think so. I mean, you look at the main blood supply down here is, is actually inside that spinal column there, okay. so it, it's still intact and this still feels normal. Might have got it normal. just in time. You know, we've got good movement through the tip of the tail. Okay. So thankfully I don't think it's eaten away too much there. 
All right, I'm just going to put some antiseptic on this. Go your hands. Let's get my syringe here. Yeah, let go. Just hurry up. Hurry up, mate. He's got to let go. It's been a long time. You give me 20 seconds, Bill. Yeah. You got that in you? You just sing out if you need to let him go, mate. To prevent the bugs that are already in Hank's system from taking hold, it's crucial I give him a shot of antibiotics right now. Ooh. Ooh he doesn't like that. Get one a little bit. Have to massage this in because it will sting a bit. You right? Well, Chris, just watch out right. there. We might have to let go. You good, Bill? Yeah. Okay, you right? I'm happy. Well done, mate. Hope now is we've got rid of that dead tissue and the healthy stuff should actually start to, to grow through. Okay. All right, let's get him away out of his hand. Yep. Before we do, while he's out, it's this week anyway, let's milk him. Yeah. Yep. Can you hold him for a sec, please? We've got 250 venomous snakes in this venom unit. We don't want to get them out more times than we have to. Hank the Tank is out and restrained. We're going to extract his venom while we've got the opportunity. Would you like to do the honours? Yeah, sure. OK. Take that. Uh, present it to his mouth there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Keen to go. whoa. OK. Yep, watch your fingers, mate. Right in. Boom. Hank launches into the glass. Wow, look at that venom. And seemingly is taking out all his frustration over what I've just done onto the glass. Good way to do it. That's 20 mil. Look at that. Nothing wrong with this end. Look at that just dripping out of his fangs there. So do I just let go now? <laughs> Not like any other snake you've seen. He won't let go of that, so yeah. we actually have to let him and the vial go in his enclosure and then get it back. So yeah. we walk in there with it. Okay. Told you, mate, when they bite on, they don't let go. Hank does not want to let go of the glass. So the way we do it is to get all of Hank into his enclosure, there. put the glass put the and Hank's head there, and then on three, let go. Ooh. How's that? Doesn't do anything slowly, does he? Everything's... Have a look at it fast. Everything's aggressive. What about that? Just a lethal cocktail. Mm. Nasty. You know, whatever these guys lack in toxicity, they make up for in sheer volume. Mm. And, and there's the proof. This is one situation where you hope that you've done the right job the first time. Because you do not want to have to come back for a second appointment. Hank could be waiting. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the Bondi Vet YouTube channel. Click on the screen now to continue watching more great content. And if you love Bondi Vet, go and support us by checking out Bondi Pet Marketplace at bondipet.com. You'll find a whole range of great Aussie pet products and services. We can't wait to see you there.